All right, so we are going to talk about inclusion classroom hacks. My name is Jess Curry, and my Twitter is at Kentucky Girl in Alabama. And like Evan said, I'm a certified trainer and a certified innovator. And if you've ever, ever wondered about either of those programs, I'm very happy to be a certified trainer. But my, I love being an innovator. It was the coolest thing I've gotten to do. So, all right, here am I. I do teach middle school special education language arts teacher. So I teach resource. I have four classes of two eighth grade classes, one seventh grade class and one sixth grade class. And I teach their English. So I take basically take our Georgia standards and kind of modify a little bit with prerequisite skills for some of my students. And then I also teach an inclusion class in the seventh grade ELA. And so I do a little bit of everything. I do love Google and I love inclusion. And I never thought I would be that person, but I really enjoy teaching middle school much more than I enjoy uh, elementary education. So, all right, so what are we gonna talk about? We are gonna talk about what's inclusion, how to engage and communicate during remote learning and in the classroom, and then what resources are out there a lot of the things that we're going to talk about or that I'm going to discuss with you are things that I've mentioned or that I've actually used myself in my classroom. I'm going to give you some free options, some paid versions, and hopefully you're able to take something and use it Monday morning in your classroom. I will also kind of give a preface that if you look in the chat box, there is the slideshow is there. And so you can go ahead and just click on it and make a copy for yourself. And that way you can actually just have the links and different resources as well. All right, inclusion can be the bomb. It's one of my favorite things. Just because a student has a label does not mean that they need to not have the same chance that a regular education student would have. All right, what is inclusion? Inclusion is a classroom that contains both general ed and special education students. It is a place that leads to collaboration, and that can be between two teachers or a teacher or pair pro or whatever you may call like a teacher's aid or instructional aid. It can be awesome. It can also be not so awesome, and we'll get into that in just a second. But the main purpose of inclusion is for you to have these students get served based off, even if they have disabilities, based off of the best way that they can learn in the classroom. So that may mean a variety of things but our job as teachers and you know this if you're you know on a Saturday watching a conference our job as teachers is to make sure that we provide the best opportunities for our students to learn for whatever position whatever they do post post school that's our job regardless of a state test regardless of in a course test our job is there to help them get ready for their future so that's my little soapbox and I'll get off of it now. All right, inclusion can either be, like I said, a great time or it can be bad. And you know, then we think about this time last year, nobody really, or at least here in the States, nobody really thought the coronavirus stuff was kind of, I mean, like we knew it was happening, but like, or at least in my area, it didn't seem like, I mean, I saw it on the news. I saw it on like CNN, TN. So you had remote learning into an inclusion classroom. And it's a hot mess. You know, remote learning is the norm now for some schools. I have been face to face with my students since August. We have not had a hybrid option. We either have your do virtual or you're back in school face to face. And then you get quarantine and vice versa. I've enjoyed getting to see my kids, but it's hard. It was really hard this time last year when I didn't get to see my kids. And so remote learning kind of can help, but can also you lose that connection sometimes with your kids. All right, but we are going to make it great and I'm hoping you get some really cool ideas from this. All right, co-teaching and collaboration, they're very similar. Co-teaching is the actual having the students, they get to have two teachers in the classroom and get to share their work. It's very similar to a marriage. And if you're ever interested in more about that, I have a book coming out hopefully soon with Edgy Match called The Collaborative Prenup, where I talk about how mar um, how co-teaching is very much like a marriage and how you need to use a prenup to help figure out all of those things in the classroom. 
But the main thing to me about co-teaching is that, you know, what if a student clicks better with you than they do the opposite person? Sometimes, you know, if a, you have that rapport with a the student, they're going to work for you and they're going to they're going to try and do all that kind of good stuff where if they know their teacher does not like them, <laughs> then you're not going to get anything out of them. I will give you a heads up though with co-teaching. What's neat about it is you have one person who is the content specialist. So if you're in a middle school setting, you have your language arts teacher, and then you have the co-teacher who's the special education teacher who should have background knowledge on how to incorporate some prerequisite skills and other activities into the teaching to make it very to make the classroom a great situation the one the one thing that can make co-teaching not so great is if there is a very defiance of these are my general ed kids and these are your special ed kids we're not collaborating and we'll talk about that in just a second the biggest tip for any type of inclusion and you know this is to have positive communication with each other whether that is you know, having a conversation face-to-face -face via remote learning or having that conversation with your teacher down the hall, but not going through email, not sending an awful text message, not venting on Facebook or TikTok about anything. You know, as teachers, we do live in a fishbowl. Twitter, we live in a fishbowl. We just need to be very careful what we put out there. And you also never know what someone's intentions are when you read an email or read a text message. So that can be a struggle for someone who, like myself, I hate confrontation. And so if I think someone's mad at me and I read a text, it just um, amps up my anxiety level. So just need to have communication for all parties. All right, how do we do this with remote learning? One more tip about co-teaching. The biggest thing, like I said, and I know I keep saying that, but there are several big things with co-teaching. For this to work, you need to be working together and need to be seamless. And that means that the kids or when an administrator walks in your room, they should be able to see that there's no difference between you and your special ed teacher or vice versa. Both kids should know that you are both equal in the classroom. Because if not, then the kids are going to know. And if you don't like each other, the kids are really going to know. And then they're just kind of said the whole classroom management and everything downhill. So just be aware of that. All right, so how do we do this with remote learning? And several of these different options that I'm gonna share with you have now added co-teaching to their repertoire. So it kind of even adds more awesomeness to what you can do. All right, Google Classroom. I think I've skipped a slide. No, I didn't. Okay, Google Classroom, my school uses Google as a platform. So I'm typically used to using Google Classroom. This is a great place to have everything for a hub for student work. There are things, different ways you can use it. The biggest tip is to make sure that both teachers are as co-teachers. And all you have to do is when you create a classroom, you can add teachers and then give them rights. And so both teachers are able to have the opportunity to see work, to grade, Maybe you noticed little Johnny is struggling with capitalizing his name because that's an issue in sixth grade for some reason today it was. And you decide, hey, have you noticed he does such and such? And it can bring up a conversation point with your co-teacher and you guys can talk about it. And you both have you both are, have the ability to see the work sample. And also when you're doing remote learning it can be very helpful or virtual learning days, whatever your school or weather days as we have done recently. It just makes it very easy to have everything in one place. All right, Google Sites. If you have never tried to use Google Sites, it's very similar to Weebly. I think Google Sites is a whole lot easier. My biggest activity that I enjoy doing this for collaboration is having the students create a site together where they can promote a project or a business or whatever for a different class. But the big thing about it is that they get to take that experience and it is project-based learning because it's a real world application because they're learning how to create a website, they're learning how to make copy, how to edit photos, how to add, to add videos, whatnot. If a student later on in life decides that they're gonna be a plumber and then they remember, oh yeah, I was in Miss Reed's class and I remember making my Google slide or my Google site, they're able to make their business that much better. 
so it's just one of those things that can eventually lead to something else for a student. And the kids get to have fun and you get to actually see mastery of something rather than just having the kids take a test. All right, Google Calendar. Google Calendar is just a great way to keep things organized, like who does what, et cetera. If you are a special ed teacher or an ELL English language learner teacher, or even just a teaching coach or coach, you know, whatever your different position is. If you have a calendar, whether it is a paper calendar, Calendly, Cozy app, as long as you have something that keeps you organized, it's gonna make your life easier and you can share with each other. I do like to use Google Calendar when I'm creating IEP meetings because I can give access to other people. I can also create a Google Keep with my calendar to kind of help organize it and other people have access to it. So just as one more thing, we all know our phones, we live by our phones. It's just one more thing to help us keep organized in the craziness that we have. All right, and here are just some more ideas. You've got Wakelet. Wakelet is just a fun and easy way to capture things. To me, it's like Pinterest for teachers on steroids. There's some really cool things. There is, she is called The Tech Lady. She's on Twitter at The Tech Lady. Kim Matina, she has a show and she actually has a whole Wakelet full of ideas for the, Jam, the Google Jamboard. And she has actually written a book with Alice Keeler and I believe they're on their second book together. So many, so many neat things to try with the Jamboard if you've never gotten to do it. You don't necessarily have to have like the big Jamboard, you can do it on your computer. But just cool ideas that you can actually see and use. Screencastify, this is just an extension that allows you to record many different ways. You can do Screencastify, Loom, Screencast, Screencast-O-Matic, whatever you depend, whatever you decide, depending on your personal school preference or whatever you want to buy. I will tell you Screencastify, I have the paid version. It's $29 a year. I've used it for several years at this point. If you have the paid version, you actually get to do editing and cropping and things. But the, the free version, you get up to five free minutes. I do think maybe if you're a teacher, you can get certain things with your, you know, your school email. I just went ahead and paid the $29. That way I have it. I'm good. I'm ready to keep going. All right, Kahoot or Gym Kit, this is something, uh, let me go back, screencast how you could collaborate, you just need to make sure that you are maybe doing a Zoom or you're recording on Zoom or you're screencastify, you wanna make sure that you have the other person in touch and they're aware that you're recording. Kahoot or Gym Kit are just review games, they're quizzes, there are free and paid ones. Kahoot is great for the younger grades, so maybe pre-K through third. Gym Kit is really good for older grades, especially eighth grade in Halloween. There is an Edgar Allan Poe review that you can do with your kids. I love Edgar Allan Poe. And the kids can actually play Zombies versus Humans, which has the students working together to beat each other, blah, 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 blah. And the kids get to review something that they know about. I wouldn't definitely would not use a Kahoot or Gym Kit every single day. I would use them sparingly, maybe as like a free time, or maybe if you are doing a review game for the day before a test. Just like any technology, you don't want to overdo it because then your kids get used to it and they won't try as hard for you sometimes. Okay, if you get nothing from me, please try Flipgrid. Flipgrid is owned by Microsoft. It is free, keyword free. So a way to get students to respond, you post, a, you post a video, the kids can respond to you. If you have students who are struggling with cognitive processing, or even they can verbalize and tell you something, but then when it, they write it down, it gets lost in translation. This is a way that you can get your students to show mastery of a subject. There's different templates. You can get, you can set it from like 30 seconds to five minutes. It's a safe space. You don't have to share it. You can be in control of if the students respond to each other. It's cool. It's one of my favorite things to do with my students because I know that I'm getting mastery when they verbally tell me something. All right, Nearpod and Pear Deck, they're both very similar. It just depends on your preference. Nearpod and Pear Deck are extensions that you can use to kind of help with a, uh, not a performance platform, but a way of showing your students different videos or presentation platforms. Pear Deck and Nearpod both have extensions that you can use in Google Slides. Nearpod, I'm a Nearpod pioneer. We have Nearpod at my school. 
Nearpod is about to come out with co-teaching for Nearpod. It has things such as paid versions for the paid version has virtual field trips, time to climb review game, and very awesome collaborative boards that are similar to Padlet. Pear Deck has some great things too for their free version. They've already had a co-teaching option, which if you ever struggle with trying to do Nearpod, it really just allows you the co-teaching op option is going to allow you both to work on a presentation at the same time, which is a great idea because sometimes, you know, we all struggle with creating different presentations and things. Google Keep, it's just a fun, easy way to keep things organized. It's very similar to like having a big post-it note on the wall. We have actually used Google Keep with one of our students to have him organize different activities in the order of importance for to do. And then the teachers have access to it and we can help him. So that is a way we are collaborating as a team to help him have that student awareness of what he needs to do. All right, here are just some other quick ideas. Dyslexia Mindset, it's a free resource that my friend Nadine Gilkinson came up with. It is also an app on the iPhone and an app on the Android. And if you have students who struggle with dyslexia, this would be something, a resource for them to try. Free Rice and Grammar Bytes are both just websites. Free Rice, if you can play a quiz game, if you get something new right, you can actually have 10 grains of rice or donated. Grammar Bytes are great for middle school and high school students because they have videos, PowerPoint presentations, and more. And it's just really like grammar, but sassy. And so it's not as they beat us sometimes. We can have videos for grammar things. All right, this is actually a Slides Mania template. If you haven't checked it out, you need to. It's a free website. She has PowerPoint. Her name is Paula. She has PowerPoint and she has Google Slides. There's interactive notebooks, agendas, way more if your students are completely virtual. This is a way that you have interactive notebooks. As a professional development, like I guess leader or presenter, we actually have in our school system, we have our middle school is doing an interactive notebook for professional development where we have created different tabs and different activities. And then when they finish it, they do a Google form or Google, yeah, Google forms to let us know that they are complete. So instead of us having to meet in a large group, which is discouraged at the current moment, everybody does it at their own pace and on their own time schedule. Very easy, very simple. There's also just some really cool ones like an elevator where if you press the button, you can go up to a different slide. I haven't figured out how to use it yet, but I want to in one of my classes. All right, Google Slides. My coolest activity that I've done for that is I love creating share decks where my students are responsible for one to three. And you could do this in a large group, small group, or even just three to four students. The one favorite activity I get to do is during Halloween, we always study Edgar Allan Poe, and so my kids take the raven. One side is the raven, and the other side is their interpretation, and they get to decorate it, decorate the stanza, whatever they want. They can put pictures, videos, anything that they want on it. And then in the bottom where it's like the notes for the presenter, they have to explain to me why they think Edgar Allan Poe wrote the way he did and how the tragedies that he has affected his life. Now you have to remember, I have my students, by the time they come to me in eighth grade, I've had them for three years. So we have talked about Poe every single year. We talk about Poe in August or Poe in October. And so every time my, my students increase the grade, we go a little more in depth because I feel like they can handle it. And so it's just a really cool, neat project. Google Docs, if you have students, this is a great way to teach digital citizenship or digital, just being even patient with one another and how to actually provide comments and authentic information for like peer editing or reviewing with one another. They can create essays and then they can edit. This is not something that your kids are going to know how to do unless they're high schoolers and maybe they've done it in another class. It's something a skill that you have to teach. And so that's great because that is a collaborative skill and effort that they have to have and use in the classroom. They also, if you're math, they can work on more problems and then you or your co-teacher could respond back and forth. Khan Academy is just, Khan Academy is better. I mean, students can watch it, but if you have parents who are struggling with your math or English, send them to Khan Academy. There are just some really cool practice edit exercises and videos and articles for everyone. There's also some teacher PD support there that if you're interested in. 
or if you just have some students who need review, Khan Academy is a great option. There is scholastic study jams. It's just helpful math for practice math and science. It's great for elementary age kids. I'm really passionate about speech therapy. This is a great resource if you have students who struggle with articulation. So if you have maybe even middle schoolers or high schools who struggle with speech. I have a three-year-old who struggles with articulation. She gets speech twice a week. And we try to do everything and anything because I wanna make sure that she feels confident when she goes into pre-K next year. And this is a website that I use with her. All right, Google Sheets, just have your students organize and collaborate on many things. They can be great in helping decide activities for inclusion as well if you're co-teaching. As a lead teacher, I have our main special ed information is on a Google Sheet with like eight different tabs. It's all in one place. Everyone who needs access to it has it and everyone can collaborate. And it's just in one place. Google Forms, this is one that uh, I would have to, I, you really have to take a pill to swallow. If you give an opportunity for your students to give you feedback and reflect, it really can make a difference in your teaching. But you have to be cautious of who you, you give it to and how honest you're really willing to listen to your students. Google Meets, we're doing a Zoom. It's great. There's so many new features for both Google Meets and Zoom to definitely use. They just keep coming. Edpuzzle, great way to do students for review and ask the students questions. Basically, they watch a video and in the middle of the video, ask a question and you get data. The best part, the kids can't skip, skip past the questions. Canva is awesome to be able to do project-based learning. You have the students create assignments that reflect the challenges that they may face in the real world. You can have the students, if they're doing a career project, they create a big poster of different things with the career, like how much they make, how much schooling and such. They can create flyers. It's a good, if you are a multimedia person, Canva is a great place to start, especially in other options, we video. Having your kids do anything that's technologically, technological, technology or digital is great. You guys have to excuse me. It is, uh, you know, almost by that time is 8.30 my time. So give me a minute. Google Jam, just a way to collaborate. You can do it on a Jamboard that are very expensive or you can do it on your computer. And there's so many different resources for Jamboard to be able to give you some ideas. Last one's Padlet, it's collaborative board. You get three free a month, great for entrance and exit. I just learned about these two the other day. Answer Garden is just a way if you post a question, you can get audience participation, brainstorming, feedback from your kids. It's really quick, really simple. And then if you are looking for any science and math simulations for students who may be virtual learners, fed.colorado.edu has free. I actually got to go in a science lab and got to see a student getting to see a sound wave and measuring a sound wave. And it was really cool. I'm not when science, I'm not a science person, but it was really, really neat. So that could be something you share with your students. And then this is just one that I've recently, her name is Katie. She is a part of the Google Innovator cohort for the, the virtual one that we did this past year. Assembly inclusion is a whole bunch of special ed stuff that's really neat and very easy to use. And she actually has some micro courses that talk about different things, special ed related. And these are just some way more resources that you get to look at in just a few minutes when you copy and create your own slideshow. And these are just some really good people to follow. Uh, Holly Clark EDU, Nadine Gilkinson, the tech lady is Kim that I told you about. Tyler Tarver actually just came out with a book. He's hilarious. He has two YouTube channels. You would never know it when you get to meet him. He's very funny. I didn't realize he was as popular as he was. Emma B. Pass has a whole book called The Hybrid Learning. She's actually coming out with a new, 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 new book. And I'm excited to see that. Steph at Tech, just some really cool different technology things. And she is actually one of the one of the first founding members of the global GEG movement. And this is my website. If you are interested in anything that I have, just science.google.com slash special sped tech teacher. And that is it. And I believe that is it. In a way, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> in 30 minutes or less. That's awesome, Ooh. Jessica. This presentation is definitely popping with tons of resources. As I said in the chat, it was amazing just to see 
like what what is out there i don't i don't know of anything you missed um i guess we can pass it off to the people in the chat or or if anyone would like to unmute and ask a question uh feel free uh, are there any questions out there for jessica <laughs> maybe they're all just so awesome they're like yes i'm just going to copy the slide and there we go <laughs> yeah that's possible i mean i guess my my big question uh because you've been you've been at this for much longer than maybe we we have here in vietnam what um what is maybe the most surprising tool in terms of usefulness, uh, specifically for virtual school, you, you've shared so many different resources. What do you think is different, uh, specifically in virtual school context, um, out of all the things that you've shared with us today? I really think the use of Google Slides, because I feel like Google Slides is not Google Doc. It's not where the kids have to create an essay or something. You can create anything within Google Slides. As you saw on Slides Mania, she has templates for interactive notebooks where you could have the kids do things. It's just a way for so many kids to learn how to, to share one resource and provide different opportunities for them to even be more so, more of the uh, educator themselves rather, so you're more of a facilitator. Also do like Google Sites because I think that's an easy way to build a website. And it's friendly and it's free and it's safe. So within, if you are doing just within your own school domain, you don't have to share it because everyone can't have the access to it unless you make it public. So I think that's really, really important. Anything that I can teach the kids how to for later in life, especially my students who I don't know if they're going to go to college. You know, my biggest concern is if my kids are going to, like, to be honest, go to high school. Are they going to get a learner's permit? Are we going to be able to live on our own? I'm not concerned about a test. I'm more concerned about providing my students authentic opportunities to learn something that they're gonna use later in life. You know, that's where I think we all kind of get caught up and virtual school kind of, I think woke all of us up a little bit because it's like, I don't see my kids every day, what do I do? You know, it kind of made us all reevaluate how are we teaching or, I mean, I hate to say this, but there's so many people leaving our profession because they don't like all the things that have happened because of virtual school. You know, it's just. No, absolutely. Uh, Sage, uh, do you have a question for Jessica? I have a question, but I know how silence can feel. So I don't know if it's threatening or what. So. I just wanted to say that, you know, all of the resources that you've shared are good for the inclusion classroom, but also for the mainstream and the homeroom and the English support and the everybody else, because what's good for learners with differences is good for all learners. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank you so much because it's a wealth of resources and I we are really grateful. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. I think some people, when you get when we do presentations, they don't realize it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of guts to apply to do a presentation. I had someone recently. I did a presentation last weekend, and you guys are my twelfth one of the year. And someone gave me a really bad review, and I was like, "That's cool, man. You did not have to answer the question. Like <laughs> you could have just kept going, just kept going. Mm -hmm. You know, it just takes a lot of effort and things." To do and it. That so one I really, really appreciate the shadow, all the rest. But and no, I like I'm someone just said they like listening to my Georgia accent. It gets really country, especially if I get tired and I've been drinking some wine, but I have not been drinking <laughs> any wine yet. <laughs> uh, thank Sage, you. Thanks for thank you for making that point. Big one. Julie, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, first of all, for all of these resources. It's such a great presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I have a question about if there are any issues with um, tech use for younger children, especially in the elementary school, um, if there are anything, any issues about age restrictions. Because um, I do, I came from a school at one point who wouldn't use Google Classroom in the elementary school because of what they thought were some age restrictions. I mean, I think you maybe hinted at it in the sense of that you could get around it by using your own 
domain, but just could you speak a little bit more to that to make sure that we're using things sure. and within um, actually we are just now into our oh my gosh, my fourth year with this system. We are just now in our third year of being one to one on Chromebooks. Um, came at a really good time. We are kind of behind a little bit when it comes to that thing, but actually our kindergartners are learning how to use Google Classroom. It's a very slow process, like they're having access to it, but you have the one thing with the students is you have to remember as a teacher, you need to provide the opportunities for them to learn because this is something that they're, whatever or whatever your platform is, Canvas, Goology, I mean, there's 800 different platforms, but it's an opportunity to let them learn. And it's not, it's like a, what is it, Dory from Finding Dory, she keeps going until she hits the thing or Finding Nemo, like you just don't know, you just keep swimming. Like you really like, I just, the biggest thing that we, or as a teacher I've had to struggle with is YouTube because my kids find the raunchiest things or like I, I pulled up a video thinking it was a, oh, well, uh, Schoolhouse Rock. And then it had like an inappropriate word in there and I not realized it. Cause you think Schoolhouse Rock is like Disney is cute. It's not. So I think that's where we've struggled. So it's more of as a, like as a teacher, but you have to have admin who support you and admin who believe in the technology. Because if you don't, then you're not gonna get anywhere. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think what about if technically Google is saying or any other platform is saying you need to be uh, over 13 to be accessing this? Is that an issue at all or not? We haven't had an issue, but now I, I teach middle school. So that's typically our our things are going to be a little higher. Um, if it's saying you need to have 13, like they're, to me, if it's saying 13 or older, kids don't need it. Okay. <laughs> like it's not. It's not Google Classroom. You know, would you say? Google. Yeah, I don't know. Huh? So that wouldn't be Google Classroom. Like what you're, not what that I'm, you say is elementary kids can access Google Classroom. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Our, that's my our, Yes, ma'am. No, I thought you were just talking about like websites in general. I was like, well, that's a 13 year old for probably Tony. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a counselor. So no. we had conversations yes. about TikTok all the time and things like that. And, you know, technically we struggled with the use of technology with the younger grades. And so gotcha. my old school, we just said, you know, we, we're just going by the legal age limits. So as, a, as an elementary school, we're saying, you know, we recommend you don't have your children on TikTok. Um, but it's always been an interesting <laughs> conversation, right? <laughs> TikTok is dangerous. I have like, I've, I'm on TikTok, but like, I'm, I don't have videos. Like I'm just on it to watch videos because I think some of them are hilarious. Um, my daughter likes to watch the dogs, the one that talk, the Huskies. Um, but we need to keep our kids as sheltered as we can because there's so much craziness right now. And so... Google Classroom, as far as I know, you can use a kindergarten and up, but TikTok and I mean, even Twitter sometimes can be a little dangerous, you know, or Instagram. Like I don't, I mean, the only reason I do Facebook is so my daughters, my, my parents, family can keep up with what we're doing because we live far away from my mom and, or my mom and dad live two doors down but from my house, but uh, my parents' family lives in Kentucky, so. Okay, great, yeah. appreciate it. No so, Jessica, I want to respect the fact that it is late at night. For those of us joining uh, joining us in Asia, it is uh, Jessica is speaking to us. It's eight eight thirty p.m. Is that right? Where you are it right is. now? You need to go to bed after everything you've shared with us today. It's been wonderful. <laughs> so, thank you. I appreciate uh, it. If we can uh, throw in the reactions, throw a quick little round of applause for Jessica and for all the great resources that she shared today. Uh, we'll make sure that her resources are posted in uh, Whova so that you can access the slides. Um, I will paste them one more time into the chat if you haven't gotten them, uh, but they will be posted on Whova shortly. So thank you, Jessica, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a good night or good morning. <laughs>